Welcome everyone uh, from around North America. I love it that you're here. This is the fifth and final of our Zoom gatherings uh, in June 2020. And uh, this is your chance to finally ask all those burning questions that have been festering inside. Uh, of questions about how books get made, how I do my work, uh, my books, my lectures, my research, things like that. So I am here to answer all those questions. We have gotten a lot of them on email, and I know that you have a lot. So uh, we're going to try to cover all of them. Now, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Robert N. Maycumber. I'm the author of the award-winning honor series of historical novels. There they are. There's 14 of them so far, and the 15th comes out in October. I also am a lecturer around the world. I normally, in a normal year, not like now, in a normal year, I do about 70 to 90 events around the world. Most of them are lectures. Um, my specialty area is Victorian Edwardian world history, which is a very fancy way to say basically from the American Civil War to World War I, a time when our current political geographic situation in the world was founded, really, the foundation was made back then, for better or worse. And it was the time when America went from being a continental country to a global power and the US Navy was in the forefront of all of that. And I get to write about it, I love that. So before we begin, we have three very simple, very basic rules. Rule number one, no current politics. Rule number two, please keep your computer muted until you want to ask a question. That way you won't interrupt somebody uh, by talking or coughing or moving your wine glass, something. So um, please keep it muted. When you want to ask a question, unmute. And then third, please buy lots of copies of my book, at least three, and give them to friends of yours for Christmas. My new book comes out in October. We're going to cover that later. That's the third rule. That may be the most important one. So let's start off tonight with a toast, as we always do on our Tuesday night gathering. Tonight's toast, we're going to return to that wonderful wine that we started out with, a 2017 Cabernet Sauvignon from City Winery of New York. And uh, I love this wine. Most of you know that I happen to be a great aficionado of city winery. Uh, there are many cities around the United States and actually North America. And our, our toast tonight comes to us from William Shakespeare and his 1602 play, The Merry Wives of Windsor. And uh, this toast is, please raise your glasses or your hands. Let us drink down all unkindness. Isn't that a great toast? It's still 450 years later is a great toast. Ah. City Winery 2017 Cabernet Sauvignon Great Wine. Now what I'm going to do tonight is I'm opening up for questions, I'm going to intersperse the live questions tonight with email questions that came in previously. So um, this is your chance. Go ahead and ask it. Be candid. Don't be shy. If you were shy, you wouldn't be awake in and you wouldn't be here. So does anybody have any questions about my research, my book, my lectures, um, anything about my work at all? Sing that. That's Ed Pinto. Ed Pinto, go ahead. Hi. Uh, I have a question about your two main characters and yeah. where they came from. Rourke, uh, 
the, the bosun and wake? Yeah, okay, that's a great question. Peter Wake is a kind of a combination of, um, of men that I've met, that I've known, that I've worked with and worked for, that were great commanding officers. Um, he is the kind of guy that everybody wants to serve under or be. And uh, Sean Rourke is based on my cousin, Sean Cloney from County Wexford in Ireland. Uh, Sean Cloney has passed on now, but he was an excellent uh, historian. He was also, a, he, he, was, he was quite an Irish wit and storyteller. And uh, he didn't look like Sean Rourke, who was a big, big guy. Uh, Sean Cloney, my, my cousin, was kind of a short little guy, but he was lots of fun. He could, you could always rely on him to inject a little levity into the situation. So those are the two that uh, those characters are based on. Great question, Ed, thank you. Okay. Now I'm gonna go to an emailed question. And this came from Stephen Belcher of Fort Myers, Florida. So here is his question. Uh, in the last session, you read the first page of your new book. When you referred to the Admiral, was he an actual person in the Navy at that time period? How do you select character names? Uh, in that first page of the new book, and you heard me reading about it if you were here last week, that is Admiral Theodorus Pentwater. And no, he is not. He is a supporting character. And, um, and you might wonder, how in the world did I come up with that name? Steve did, and he asked that question. Well, Theodorus was one of those 19th century names, just like Leonidas or um, Phineas or some of these other really interesting names that are fun to pronounce. And so I wanted him to have that name. And in the book, he plays a short role right at the beginning. And he is a, a relatively crucial role because you'll see um, how things unfold because of that. Okay, now, do we have any other questions live? Bob, this is Carl, can you hear me? Yes, Carl, thank you. I was wondering when you say award-winning, uh, I've always wondered in the, your industry, the publishing industry, how do, I know some awards are based on sales, but how do awards work domestically and internationally? And do you apply and are there fee, fees involved or do your publishers do this work for you? How do awards work? That's a great question. You know what? I've never had that question. That's a great question. Um, okay, here's how it works. Awards are, are given based upon a jury panel that reads the book. And these are peers. These are uh, uh, literary professors. Uh, uh, these are librarians. These are booksellers. These are people in the business, other authors. My last book that came out last year, Honoring the Enemy, has so far gotten uh, three awards. And it's a process where people can, people's books can be nominated by many different kinds of people. They can be nominated by publishers. They can be nominated by uh, readers. They can be nominated by managers or agents. They can be nominated by authors. Um, and these, I, my hat's off to these people in the juries because they have to read a lot of books. And um, I'm very proud of the fact that I've won these awards for this last book. Uh, others, other of my books have won awards. Um, and it means a lot to me because it's a, they're given by your peers. Some of the awards do have fees when you submit them, and, uh, and some don't. It, there's different rules on that. 
Some are genre genre specific, uh, some are not. Do we have another question? Bob, Dave Kahn. Hi, Dave. How are you doing? My co-adventurer in Cuba. Right. I just wanted to go on record as saying when we first met, you were promoting your second book at a, a meeting in Fort Myers, and I didn't have any money. And I said, would you trust me? And you said, well, I've never done that before, but you look like an honest guy, so I will. And who would have known what a long friendship that started? So thank you, brother. <laughs> thank you, Dave. Um, Dave has come with me to Cuba when I take my readers to Cuba. He's come twice, and he's had a great time. And now I'm going to get to another emailed question. And this is from Captain Mark Golden, United States Navy, retired from um, Pennsylvania. And um, let, me get my, let me get my notes here. And he has asked actually several questions. I'm going to cover the first one. And that is, uh, and I see that Mark is here. Um, and that is, do you own your own sailboat and sail, sail it? Uh, tell us about it. Is it gaff rigged as were the ones in your books? That's a good question. And yes, I do. I've owned many boats in my lifetime. I've been a sailor for 57 years uh, since I was a boy. Uh, I raced offshore. For 30 years, I was a offshore skipper at age 17. And my current boat is my smallest boat, and it's one of my best. Uh, it is a 15 foot pocket cruiser. It is a fractional sloop rig, it's not gap rig. And uh, actually, I'm going to be sailing on her uh, tomorrow morning at 0700. I'm going out to the remote islands nearby here and reading Russian history as research for a future book. That's a hint. And um, she only draws 15 inches with the centerboard up and the rudder up so I can go back into the back bayou country that I grew up in here. So yes, um, and I go uh, sailing uh, at least once a week, uh, more if I can. Now, if anybody wants to see a picture of me, racing offshore, you can go to my website, robertmaycumber.com, go to the photo page, scroll all the way down to the bottom, the very first photo, and you'll see two pictures of me, uh, ocean racing on the, on the coast of Cuba on the way to Mexico uh, 33 years ago. And uh, you can see what I look like then, and uh, you, can, uh, you can see that it was one of those gorgeous, days with the trade winds. It's perfect. So that's the answer to Mark Golden. And if we have time, I'm going to get to Mark's other uh, questions. But right now, I want to open it up for somebody live here tonight. Bob? Yes? Yeah. Uh, well, I go back even longer than Dave. <laughs> I carded you at the Banyan Bookshop when you were selling your first book. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So anyhow, I, 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 I really have been fascinated with the different settings you've used in your book. And did you start originally because you wanted to work with this particular area where we live? Excellent question. And the answer is yes. I wanted to tell the story of the Civil War on the coast that I, that I grew up in and I still live in. Uh, many people don't know that the Civil War happened in Florida. Florida was the third state to secede. Uh, the Civil War was extremely active in Florida, and it was very active in the islands that I come from. And so I wanted to tell that story. And uh, so my first three books cover that, and also action in other areas of Florida, the Bahamas, Cuba, and Mexico. It was all part of the action here, and it was all in the theater of operations for the squadron operating out of here. That was, thank you very much for that question. So now I'm going to go to an email question from Valerie um, Atala of Bonita Springs, Florida, and she has an intriguing question. And you know what? It's one that has bothered me too. 
So she said, can you tell me any history or info about Maracumbe in the Florida Keys or in Cuba? Now, Maracumbe, there are two islands called Maracumbe, Upper Maracumbe and Lower Maracumbe in the middle Florida Keys. They're part of the, uh, of the now city of Isle Morada. And I cannot find a Maracumbe in Cuba. However, uh, as far as the Maracumbe in the Florida Keys, that was on the Spanish charts as long ago as 1733. It's called Maracumbe uh, de Vieja, which means Mata old Maracumbe. Um, and there is no translation for Maracumbe. British charts continued that. And so what we find when we look at old charts is sometimes the chart maker didn't get the terminology right. They were going on what they thought the pronunciation was. The word for kill is matag in Spanish. Mata is the past tense, he killed. Cumbe is not a Spanish word, but uh, we know that comi or comer is the word to eat. Comi is the word for eaten. So there is a possibility that the name has something to do with somebody who was killed and eaten. The local natives at the time, the pre-Columbian inhabitants, the Calusa, uh, were not cannibals. And uh, so that doesn't fit. But we do know that the islands of the Florida Keys for about three and a half centuries were known as by the Spanish as the islands of the martyrs because thousands of Spanish uh, sailors were shipwrecked and killed there during the shipwrecks. Uh, so death is part of that name, but beyond that, we just don't know for sure. Okay, now Jerry Dorf, uh, you had a question, so I wanna go to you for the next question. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Bob. Um, my question has to deal with um, Peter Wake, and I hope this isn't too political, but I'd like to know, um, he in his life has uh, encountered some great people all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's um, anyone that could get into his mind, you're probably the best one. And I wonder if you could guess how he would rate maybe the top two or three greatest people that he met in his life, and maybe uh, the worst two or three people he's uh, met in his life throughout the whole world. Well, that's an interesting question because it gets into 19th century uh, and early 20th century acquaintances. Um, that's a very interesting question. I've never gotten that question before. I would think that he would rate, he, would, he had met many of the top leaders of the world. But in America in particular, he would rate Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, um, probably President Harrison, the second President Harrison, Grover Cleveland, and, and uh, Theodore uh, Roosevelt as the greatest. As far as naval officers go, uh, he was a great admirer of John Grimes Walker, who uh, oversaw the first uh, Office of Naval Intelligence. He wasn't the director, he was above the director, but he was a great supporter of that. He also was a great um, admirer of George Dewey, um, who he first met in 1883 in the South China Sea. If you read one of my books, you'll find out about that. And Peter Wake um, has interacted with all of these people. So um, those are the ones that he liked the best. The ones that he liked the worst were probably the, uh, the opponents in espionage that he had to deal with, and many of whom did not measure up to any semblance of honor. Uh, and they, uh, 
they proved to be deadly not only to him, uh, but to other people too. I just say one thing yes. about the last one. Uh, reading your books, I would have to say that Army Colonel in Key West was one of the least favorite of his people. Yes, yes, uh, yes, that's true. Uh, that would have been one in my first books, but yes, yeah, I, you're right. I, you know, I wrote those so long ago. I kind of it's hard for me to remember everything that's in every one of these books. But Mark, that's a great point. Thank you. So from Jay Brinkman in Texas, he also emailed a very interesting question. Here are his comments. After having read O'Brien, Forrester, and Lambden, and others over the years, what really struck me in your series is how much time Peter Wake spends on land rather than on water. This seems particularly true with the books based in Spain, Italy, North Africa, Peru, and Indochina. Was this simply because there was not a lot taking place on the water for the U.S. Navy between the Civil War and the Spanish-American War? Or was it your intention all along to transform Peter from sailor to a spy on land? No, it was not my intention. And he goes back and forth. He does, you know, his career starts in 1863. It, it won't end until 1908. Um, and from 1863 to 18, 1882, he is at sea. And uh, he ends up on land occasionally. Uh, which happens to the best of naval officers. And, uh, and then in 1882, he joins the brand new Office of Naval Intelligence. That was our first and our only uh, spy agency that the United States had overseas all the way until the turn of the century in the early 1900s. They did excellent work. And it was uh, ONI, Office of Naval Intelligence, that helped transform the United States Navy into a modern Navy. Also, I wanted to cover some of the confrontations that we had, we, the United States, had in these various spots. And it was the Navy that had to handle the confrontations in the South Pacific and in North Africa and in Asia and in Latin America. And so, uh, I covered those in a way. Now, did we have any major wars in that time? No. Uh, some of that is because of the good work of the naval officer. They defused things or deterred them, which is what they're supposed to do and what they continue to do to this very day, this very evening. Naval uh, officers and, and sailors are all over the world uh, defusing and deterring wars. So, um, he, uh, Jay also goes further and says, I confess I occasionally find myself siding with Peter. Get me off the land and back on a boat. Yes! Wake is tired of espionage work. And in the 1890s, he goes back to sea. And he gets several great commands. But the problem is he's got skills in espionage that are very needed. And it's known that he can handle things. So periodically, he's what is called TDY, temporary duty assignment, back to handle a problem. So um, now we're going to go to um, Ellen uh, whoops, Katalinich. And I have to get to the. Uh, Oh, there it is. Okay. Her email question was, and there's Ellen. Okay. Uh, will you reveal the connection between Agnes uh, Whitehall, actually it's Whitehead, and Peter Wake and his family? Yes, I will. In my seventh book, you discovered through the uh, finding of the trunk in the attic in Key West about Agnes uh, Whitehead. And uh, in a future book, you're going to find out the entire connection. It's not in, the, it's not in uh, my next book. It's in the book after that. But uh, you're going to get the whole thing. But I got to tell you, I have dropped a lot of hints in these books since 
uh, my seventh book, which is this one, Honor Dead. So you might want to go back and reread them and look for the hints. And you might catch it already. I've already had readers uh, correctly predict what the connection is. So, Can I interject for a moment because very quickly, go ahead. Go ahead. You are, you are, you, you've just touched on a subject that is, how do you far ahead are you planning <laughs> these books? Although, You're writing number four, are you thinking of number 10 also? Yes, the answer is yes. Um, I do research way ahead. I salt things in a book that you might not understand until later books come along. I do that intentionally. I want to intrigue you. And when you read a book later on, I want you to go, oh, wow. I remember this from the other book. And so uh, that's fun for me to do. And I love it when I get emails from readers that go, hey, now I understand. Now, before we run out of time, I want to remind everybody about my next book, a word of honor. It's going to be officially uh, released by the United States Naval Institute on the 15th of October, 2020. Uh, here are a few tips on exactly what to do in October. So all hands, listen up. Uh, if you want personally inscribed copies of any of my books, but particularly word of honor from me, simply order them through my website and go to the home page and click on the buy books button. It's pretty straightforward. And they will get mailed to you. I'll sign them and they will get mailed to you and whomever you wish. Um, now, if you have a favorite bookstore, we have people here from all over North America and I hope you have a favorite local bookstore. I really do. If you do, then please go to them, call them, and order the book through them. Let's try to keep our bookstores alive and healthy, please. If those two options are not your choice, then please order at Amazon.com on the 15th of October. I think it would be great if we everybody ordered on Amazon that wants to do that on one day. And what that will do is that will get in my genre, that might get us up to best-selling status. That would be fun, wouldn't it? And you'd be part of it. So also, please do a brief review at Amazon. Uh, those really help the ranking and the sales numbers. So I hope that... Um, You've had a lot of fun on these five Zoom gatherings. It's been fun for me. You know I love interacting with Wakeans around the world. And I want to leave you, uh, my dear friends, with my life motto. This became my life motto about 17 years ago. And it's very simple. You've heard me say it before. Onward and upward, no matter what toward those distant horizons that a sailor knows so well. Onward and upward. Thank you for being the very best readers an author could hope for. Good night, everybody. God bless you. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good night. Please be safe. Thank you. Be safe. And stay in touch. Send me an email, send me a private message. Give me a call. Give me a call. <laughs> send a carrier pigeon.